Good morning, everyone. I am so pleased to welcome you all to the Commonwealth Club this morning. I'm Gloria Duffy, president and CEO of the club, which is an organization celebrating its 115th year this year. In fact, the club is the oldest cultural organization in San Francisco. We are so honored to host the exclusive presentation of the Giving USA annual report on philanthropy data here in the Bay Area in association with CCS Fundraising and the Foundation Center West. A special thanks goes to the Indiana University Lilly Family School of Philanthropy for preparing the data. I see many friends and colleagues in the audience today like the dynamic duo of John Farmer and Dennis Collins, and I'm thrilled you could all join us here in our new headquarters, the first owned home of the Commonwealth Club. We opened this building in October of last year, and at this critical and very intense time in California and American history, we're proud to be a home for civil dialogue on the most important issues of the day. Of course, this beautiful building and others like it in our region could never have been built without support from philanthropists. Generous donors have been responsible for building and sustaining our region's civic, cultural, and educational organizations. Our capital campaign received over 400 gifts from many individuals, corporations, and foundations, many of whom have supported our organization for decades. Others were newer donors whose companies, particularly in the tech industry, didn't exist just a few years ago. We are so thankful that these individuals and entities believed in the Commonwealth Club and its mission, and it's because of them that we have the first home for the Commonwealth Club in our history. You can see many of the names of the generous donors as you look around our building today. Over the past decade, along with the growth of the local economy, we've seen the absolutely critical importance of philanthropy, not only in supporting capital campaigns like ours, but also addressing regional disparities in poverty, housing, education, health care, and as we saw so graphically in the North Bay last year, providing disaster relief. Philanthropy is a way of life in the Bay Area, and it is needed more than ever. It's in the DNA of our region and its citizens, and that's why I'm proud we are hosting today's event. Understanding trends in philanthropy, particularly from definitive studies like Giving USA, helps me and all of my colleagues inside and outside the Commonwealth Club and other nonprofit organizations to sustain our organizations into the future. In addition to philanthropy, our region's strengths also come from recognition that we are stronger together. We believe wholeheartedly in collaborations and partnerships to further our work in service of the community. Our partnership today with two outstanding organizations committed to strengthening our regional social sector is a testament to the power of collaboration. A big thanks to CCS Fundraising and the Foundation Center West for co-presenting today's event. Before turning our program over to our moderator for the day, Rick Happy of CCS Fundraising, I would like to personally extend an invitation to all of you to come visit us again here at the Commonwealth Club. I'd love to welcome you back to experience the club's wide array of programs, and please do consider hosting an event in this beautiful space. Now I'm pleased to introduce Rick Happy of CCS Fundraising, Principal and Managing Director of one of the country's leading fundraising consulting firms, who will discuss the results of this year's Giving USA study from both a national and regional perspective. Thank you again. We are proud to host you. Rick? I want you to know it's a big achievement for me. I've never done that before, so. <laughs> Thank you very much. If my parents were alive to see it. Uh, so uh, thanks very much. And does, I want to just give you a little bit of a warning. Uh, you're going to need your phones in about two seconds because we're going to ask you to do a little bit of an online poll. You can see our panelists, and again, I'll have them come up in a few minutes. A little bit about CCS. Gloria was so kind in talking about the firm. We've been in, uh, serving the nonprofit uh, sector across the country for more than 70 years now. We have offices all over the U.S., as you can see, and 350 professional staff dedicated to our clients and our work. And you can see some of the great organizations that we have the privilege of working with in the Bay Area uh, and beyond. Um, at the conclusion of this, I would encourage you to, to go to goto.ccs.fundraising.com, 
backslash 2018 landscape to download the data and additional data from today's uh, presentation. We're gonna look at the Giving USA data. We're gonna take a look at the Bay Area landscape. I'm gonna ask our friends in the panel to come up. I'm gonna moderate a panel, ask them some questions, and then we're gonna have you ask them some questions as well. So first, what I'd like you to do is take your phones out, and we're gonna just do a little poll to see who is here and do we, uh, uh, about you. So the text is to 22333, text CCS, and then you're gonna answer three questions. Uh, this is the first, what describes, what sector best describes your organization? So we'll give you a second before we move forward. So again, 22333, text CCS, and then answer one through nine. Our big fear was this was not gonna work, so we're glad about that. <laughs> There you go. So it looks like the audience is comprised of the education sector, human and social services, health, arts, culture, and humanities, and then a few folks from the environment, foundations, international affairs, and religion. Do we want to move to the next slide? People are still filling this out. Thank you very much. And that is, what's your organization's budget, budget size? Less than a million, one to five, five to 10, 10 to 20, more than 20. The organization's budget size. Isn't that working? No. <laughs> so we have some big organizations here. Okay, and then we're gonna to move to the third slide, which is how much did your organization raise from philanthropic support in 2017? Different than the budget size, less than half a million, half a million to a million, one to five. five. So again, a lot of very successful um, fundraising taking place in the room. This was very helpful to us. Thank you very much. It gives us a good sense of who's here. And I think for our panelists, when you, uh, we're going to ask you when you ask questions to tell us. Yes? Did you ask how many people actually really participated? How, do we know how many people participated in, in, this, in this poll? About 80. About 80. We have about 80, it says. Okay. Let's jump into the data. So how did the landscape change in 2017? The big news is the first time ever more than $400 billion was given across the country to philanthropy. $410 billion. It's the most ever. Uh, it's an increase of about 5.2%. We'll talk about that in a second. 70% of it came from individuals. 16% of it came from foundations. 9% of it came from bequests. And 5% of it came from corporations. So you, you read that right. Dead people are more generous than corporations. So I just want to make sure we're clear about that. <laughs> Almost twice as generous, sadly enough. <clears throat> so, uh, giving by individuals increased $14 billion over the last year. Overall, as I said, a 5.2% uh, uh, increase. The six largest subsectors all saw increases in giving. Individuals drive philanthropy, all kidding aside, bequests, those foundations, about half of them are probably family driven or individually driven and individual gifts. So individuals comprise probably 90% of all philanthropy. So you can see the compound annual growth rate over the last uh, four years of 3.4% from individuals. Foundation giving is up substantially, 6%. You can see the growth rate over the last four years also at 6%. Corporate giving, all jokes aside, up 8%, which is terrific to see. $40 million from corporations in, uh, uh, in response to natural disasters. And bequests up 2.3%. Last year, we, it was compounded over 8% um, uh, in the last four years. Who gets the money? Well, this hasn't changed very much in probably the last 10 to 15 years. About 31% to religious organizations. Not religious schools or religious hospitals or other organizations, houses of worship. 
31%. Educational institutions got about almost $60 billion, 14%. About three quarters of that goes to higher educational institutions. About a quarter of it goes to primary and secondary edu educational institutions. 12% to human and social services, 11% to foundations, 9% to healthcare organizations. You can see the remaining uh, in terms of that. This is a pretty steady. Last year was about 32%. From, uh, that went to religious organizations, but it hasn't really moved off that third mark in about 15 years. Um, the increases were very, very uh, um, encouraging. 15% increase in, in, in foundations. Only international affairs, interestingly enough, declined. 4.4%, and you can see the other sectors, education, arts, public society, health, all up six, seven, eight percent this is a little bit of an imperfect slide, so I, I don't want to have it be too much of a distraction to us because these are the publicly, publicly reported gifts of a million dollars or more in the top 10 sectors. A lot of institutions, as we know, don't report publicly their large gifts, so this can be a little bit misleading, but it does tell us some interesting um, uh, stories. Colleges and universities receive a uh, preponderance of the seven, eight, and nine-figure gifts in this country, even though it's the second largest sector. Religious organizations, as large as the sector is, don't receive those kinds of gifts. Um, you can see in uh, arts and culture, a billion dollars. Healthcare, $2.1 billion. Again, those are also organizations that tend to attract seven, eight, maybe even nine-figure gifts. Again, this is a bit of an imperfect slide because either these are just publicly reported gifts but it just gives you a sense of um, the distribution. If you know what the GDP is, you'll have a good sense of what philanthropy is. For the last five of the last six years, it has been about 2.1% of the gross domestic product. So at the end of this year, or January in 2019, you learn what the gross domestic product was for 2018, you have a pretty good sense, about 2%, 2.1% of that is um, philanthropy. Over the last 40 years, it's also remained pretty much between 1.9 and 2.1%. So it's, that's a, it's a function of our um, economic growth more than anything else. Now, individual giving is, a percent, uh, is stable as a percentage of disposable personal income. So that's also about 2%. So we kind of get a sense of what that is. What's, your, what's the disposable personal, personal income in a region, in a state, you can have a sense that 2% of that is what your philanthropic results are going to be. We'll see a slide in a, a few minutes about Bay Area gross domestic product. It already tells us what the uh, ph philanthropy is within the Bay Area. So total charitable giving in 2017 was almost, uh, versus the S&P, the S&P was almost 17% giving, and inflation adjusted 3%. Now what will be interesting is right now the S&P year to date is about 4% the S&P 500. If that holds through the end of this year, we have no idea how will that impact giving. Um, what we've seen generally and traditionally is the impact is not, this, 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 again, the steadying factor is the gross domestic product. It's not the S&P 500. It's not the Dow Jones Industrial Average, but it really is more about GDP. We live in a very generous country. 91% of wealthy households, high net worth individuals, liquid net worth of a million dollars or more, give. And they give an average gift of, uh, they give average about $25,000 annually. More than half the population gives overall, and the average amount given is about $2,500. Um, high net worth individuals tell us that they plan to give as much or more through 2018 and beyond. So when you hear things like donor fatigue or volunteer fatigue or, you know, can we go back to the, uh, the same well and, and are, they're all tapped out, don't believe it. They can give more and they want to give more. So let's take a look now at the Bay Area philanthropic landscape and what some of this means. This is now the greater Bay Area. And again, this data is not as, not, not that it's not precise, but Giving USA does not do the same level of data within regions that they do nationally. But in the Bay Area, we have 44,000 uh, public charities, 95 billion in total nonprofit revenues, 250, almost 250 billion in, in assets, a median household income of 77,000, more than 50 billionaires, 76,000 millionaires, and 14 of the country's wealthiest cities. We have 19 Bay Area nonprofits on the Philanthropy 400 list. Um, we had members of the Philanthropy 50 from the Bay Area contributing $2.3 billion last year. Those are four people. 
and 6.8 billion raised in 2017 by those 19 Bay Area nonprofits on the Philanthropy 400 list. In Silicon Valley, we see a increases across the board. 47% increase in Silicon Valley in private foundations between 2005 and 2015. That's twice the national growth rate. 150% increase in Silicon Valley in individual charitable donations between 2008 and 2013. A almost 300% increase in the number of Schwab and Fidelity uh, donor advised funds in Silicon Valley in the 10 years between 2005 and 2015. You can see some of the other statistics about that, but we hear a lot about Silicon Valley tech giving. We'll talk more about that with the panel, but I think this is also encouraging as we see the rate of growth um, in Silicon Valley. Now you saw the previous slides earlier about religion, education, human services, health, in terms of the sectors. In the Bay Area, if we look at the largest nonprofits, it's almost reversed. Is that us? <laughs> Human services are 18%, arts and culture 15%. International aid, the one sector that declined in 2017 is 12% of, um, uh, represents 12% of the largest Bay Area nonprofits. Health is 10%, education 9%. Tells you a little bit about um, uh, what are the priorities in the Bay Area and the, and the folks who live here. Now, individual giving, the average gift size in the Bay Area exceeds the average gift size in California, but the percentage of income giving in the Bay Area is 2.7% compared to 2.9%. That graph's a little misleading, uh, but it's 2.7 to 2.9. Income, average income, average contribution by income level, excuse me, 200,000 plus, you can see 17,000, but you can see the very generous in, uh, uh, average contributions from people across the spectrum in terms of their incomes. And I think that's one of the things we find that people are generous um, uh, regardless of what their income is. So the gross domestic product, the greater Bay Area is 781 billion. So 2.1% of that is about 16.4 billion. That's how much we could surmise was given away in 2017 by people in the Bay Area. 36 Fortune 500 companies, 62 Fortune 1000 companies. And you can see what this corporate giving and the potential is. Gilead Sciences, was number one in corporate giving uh, in 2015 in Foster City with cash contributions of 446 million and they get 412 million um, in 2016. A lot of that's a science research, but 11.6 million to Bay Area charities. Foundations, um, there are almost 4,000 grant making foundations in the Bay Area that have 171 billion in cumulative assets. Again, their gifts are easy to track uh, and since 2000, more than 4,650 gifts of a million dollars or more have been granted by 287 of our Bay Area foundations. 233 gifts of 10 million and more, and 16 gifts of 100 million dollars and more. And you can see their priorities, higher education, public society benefit, international aid again, in the environment, conservation, and animal welfare. We hear a lot about donor advised funds and what that means in the evolving landscape around foundations. Five of the top 10 organizations in the Philanthropy 400 are donor advised funds. Number one is Fidelity. Number three is Goldman Sachs Philanthropy Fund. Schwab is number six. The National Christian Foundation is eight and Vanguard's 10. The largest general operating support funders, Gates, Hewlett, Ford, Silicon Valley Foundation, and uh, Packard. We're gonna talk a little bit with our panel uh, about tech giving, and you can see the top 10 gifts from individuals who made their uh, fortunes in tech in 2017. The Gates Foundation, obviously. The Gates Foundation, interestingly enough, is after the United States and Great Britain gives more money to world health, global health, than any other entity. It's about $2.9 billion every year. Mark Zuckerberg and Priscilla Chan, of course, are in the news with their foundation and the uh, Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, and you can see some of the others. So we're gonna, I'm going to close here um, because I'd love to get the panel up here, but just to, to take a, one peek here, the, the Dell Foundation surveyed 700 social impact professionals to understand how philanthropy and philanthropists were changing. More than half say they're taking a long-term view of engagement in a particular social issue. More than the third said they're more concerned with impact than personal recognition. 
and almost 20% said the ability to raise awareness and mobilize resources from a diverse group of stakeholders is very important. The middle one I would just emphasize, we hear this all the time when the client organizations we're lucky enough to serve, that donors are motivated by impact, not recognition, not the benefits of a, a new tax uh, bill or uh, tax cuts or things like that, but impact. And what they also tell us is they want to hear from the organizations that they support that their gifts are impactful. Only one in five organizations tells them that their gifts are impactful. So it's important to remind you to tell your donors how impactful their gifts are, whether it's $100 or $100 million, but those gifts are making a difference. So if I could ask Heather and Daniel and Chuck to come up and take a seat, we'd love to take some time. I'm gonna ask them some questions and then I'm going to um, open it up to the panel. <laughs> The music was going to start in three minutes, so I thought, mm, let's hurry along here. Again, let me say thanks to Chuck and Heather and Daniel for taking your morning. We really appreciate that. There's a little bit of grumbling in the audience, I know, about the Warriors and the parade. <laughs> There's going to be a parade next year and the year after that and the year after that. So everybody just chill out, okay? The big four aren't going anywhere. So again, thanks. I guess let me start with some questions. Um, Big picture, what's your takeaway from the report? What's your takeaway about the, 2008, the 2017 data report and your reactions to it? And what are the, your key takeaways? Chuck, you want to kick us off? Sure. I think one of the key takeaways is that this is a generous community. We're in a generous Bay Area at a remarkable point in time. I mean, this is a historical opportunity for our community to make a huge impact on the future of this region and they're reaching towards it. Many people are sort of pessimistic about the giving patterns of young people, and I would say that we should pay attention to the fact that this report tells us that personal recognition is so much less important than serious impact. And the issues of social justice and income separation and poverty and health and educational opportunity, the equity gaps are what our donors um, and our philanthropists are really focusing in on. Daniel and I were having sort of a fun little uh, comment like nationally arts is down, but in the Bay Area, arts and culture really matter because we're endowed with remarkable assets, our arts and culture, our environment, our educational opportunity, and our economy. So our job in the nonprofit sector is to bring it all together. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Heather? I'm, obviously, we live in this incredible economy right here, and we're very lucky because jobs are being created, the economy is booming, wealth is going up. Not surprisingly, philanthropy is going up with that wealth. So I agree, very generous region. And some of our data and our research for the Giving Code report also looked at where that money's going. And I think one of the questions, not just what issues it's going to, but is it going to community-based organizations? Is it going to those organizations serving the lowest income, the people who are being left behind right. in this economy. So I think that's an important question to hold on this panel as we discuss these findings. Yeah. I, I, I'm with Chuck in that I'm optimistic. Uh, and like this crowd, if, if you are in development and fundraising, you have to be optimistic. Um, <laughs> and we at Tipping Point have to uh, believe that our best days are ahead of us in terms of getting young people engaged. Uh, we are seeing these companies, these tech companies, getting more active, um, whether it's through altruistic reasons or business necessity. Uh, we are going to see a boom in philanthropy, I believe, and I think those numbers point to that. Yeah. How do you, you know, for people in the audience, how should they, what should they take away from these findings? What, how should they, you know, you, Daniel, Chuck, you talked about, you know, it's encouraging, and Heather, you said there's impact. How do, are those the messages you think for, for, for this audience and for, you know, um, nonprofits that, you know, there's good, a lot of good news and we hear a lot of bad news in this world, um, but there's good news here too. Well, I guess I would say, it, you know, to that last slide, people want impact, you know, young, younger donors say that they want impact. And this is where I think the established donors also want impact. We just have more data available to us now than we've ever had before. And so, there's no question in my mind that young and established um, want to see that their dollar is being used wisely. And so we have to, as fundraisers, as organizations that are raising dollars, have to not only show the impact, but also 
show them the passion mm -hmm. that we all have. I think that that is that goes so far, um, and and I think that last slide really showed that. I thought one of the slides I was really intrigued by was the the um, sort of backward staircase where you're showing that the organizations, human service organizations that we have the greatest right. number of in the Bay Area right. um, are actually one of the least favorite giving causes, right? Yeah. So I think that's interesting because yeah. I do think in terms of supply and demand of philanthropic capital in the marketplace, um, we are seeing that you know some of these donors are preferring to give to hospitals, universities, make big bets with their philanthropy, give yeah. to larger institutions, and so um, I think we need more intermediaries like the Tipping Point that are going to help aggregate this capital for smaller organizations that are an important part of the ecosystem. Yeah. Um, I think my advice to nonprofit fundraisers, you know, we'll, we'll talk more on this panel, I'm sure, about the mindsets of these new donors, but I do think um, these smaller nonprofits are sometimes at a disadvantage and they need to learn how to play this new game. And that means reporting on metrics, using the language of business, right. talking about innovation. Um, it's, it's meeting these donors where they're at. Right. You know, Rick, I would say that, you know, one of the big pictures is that the United States is one of the few countries in the world that really has a well-established philanthropic sector. Right. And the reason that the government created the code that then allows nonprofit deductibility is essentially to eliminate the burden of government. We're also at an intersection right now in the Edelman Trust Report, which is an annual report on, on integrity, says that we're at an all time low in terms of trust in government. Right. So if in fact the nonprofit sector writ large is to alleviate the burden of government, I think these numbers prove that more than a few people believe that the nonprofit, non-governmental, other sectors that are represented in philanthropy are really important at this time in history. Chuck, do you think some of that too is also a reaction to you know, the, the, the political environment that donors are saying, you know, I care about climate change, I care about immigration rights, I care about these issues that we're not seeing the government really kind of prioritizing. Is that part of this change too? Well, I think the data is going to indicate, you yeah. know, that that's an important pattern. But now I'm going to talk out of both sides of my mouth. And I'm going to say that we have in San Francisco a remarkable public sector. Mm -hmm. Our Department of Children, Youth, and Their Families allocates money every year. And this year, they're allocating it on a five-year basis. And they're doing it, going back to what Daniel was saying, is that we're increasingly a data-driven environment. And when we can really look at social impact through the lens of data, and we have public partners such as our Department of Children, Youth, and Their Families, our Public Health Department, and others, then what we're doing is making progress together. And we all recognize that all of these persistent social issues take more than one quarter, or one year, or three years to really have impact. And this is, again, the, the work that, that my co-panelists are doing is looking at long-term systemic change. Mm -hmm. And how do we partner together often to, to make sure that we're all running together and not all in our own little bailiwick. Yeah, and I, I was just going to say, I think the government partnership piece is critical because in philanthropy, um, we often think of it as sort of leverage capital, right? Philanthropy can do a lot of things around funding innovation and bringing the best mindset of the private sector into solving social problems, but government is really where the largest amount of resources are. So I think the smart philanthropists today are recognizing that to create that systemic change, they need to fund advocacy, and they need to find ways to partner with government and unlock those resources and help those resources be more effective in how they're deployed. Um, Emerson Collective being just one example, yeah. but even the Gates Foundation, if you look at what they've done in public health, they've realized that their money, even though they have tens of billions of dollars, pales in comparison to the money of international governments. And so they've used their capital as leverage to unlock right. government money. Mm -hmm. uh, a local example uh, it is our work on chronic homelessness here in, uh, in San Francisco. We pledged $100 million to cut chronic homelessness in half but only in partnership with the city and county of San Francisco. I will push back and say um, that some of our uh, partners in, 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 in city government need more resources and need help on the data piece. And I think they are lagging behind um, the tech sector and the business community here in San Francisco, which should not be the case. I mean, we should have a, a, a city hall that functions at the highest levels. And I think we are behind on that. Now, that $100 million, spent down over three years. This year, Jeff Kaczynski's Department of uh, Supportive of Housing and 
homelessness and supportive housing will spend at least $300 million. The city and county of San Francisco will probably spend five, six, seven hundred million dollars on our homeless issue here in San Francisco in one year. So absolutely, the dollars in the philanthropic sector, no matter the scale that we can ever get to, pales in comparison to government. But do you think, Daniel, that your the hundred million dollars from tipping point, I think maybe to your point, Heather, helped spur that public investment? Uh, well, no, they were actually spending that already. What we yeah, we yeah, absolutely yeah. are. Our goal is to have them spend their dollars, not more dollars necessarily, but spend it more wisely mm -hmm. um, and more effectively. And so we have three pillars. One is create more housing. Uh, the second is to prevent people from sliding into homelessness. But our third, and this is where the partnership is, is to optimize the public sector. Right. Um, we do have companies inside City Hall helping with, with interns or with data projects, but if we can get them to think about spending their 300, 400, 500 million dollars more effectively, that's a huge win. Yeah, that's great. Let's talk a little bit about tech giving. We hear this all the time. Uh, this is one of the things we, we, you know, we advertise as part of the program today is tech giving. Um, you know, younger donors, millennials, all those kinds of things. You know, this region is really known for innovation, disruption. Um, how has the sort of nonprofit sector, if you will, and fundraising in the Bay Area evolved to sort of incorporate that disruptive, innovative ethos of the Bay Area? Yeah, so I think, I mean, our, again, our data and our research in the Giving Code, which was really specific to San Mateo and Santa Clara County, so it was more the peninsula mm -hmm. than it was San Francisco per se, but our data um, pointed out that, that many of our nonprofits are really struggling and, um, you know, they're having to compete for talent, um, with tech companies, they're having to pay rent that's going up and up and up. 80% report an increased demand in services. So a lot of our social service agencies, in fact, many of the t types of organizations that Tipping Point supports are really struggling and they're finding it hard to connect to these new donors. So part of why we wrote the giving code was to try and understand these disconnects. Yeah. So some nonprofits are doing very well. Typically the larger organizations that have really large fundraising staff, Stanford has 600 people in its development department, right? right? Many of the types of organizations that can hire your firm, my daughter's at Castilea, they're a <laughs> client of yours. Um, so the hospitals, universities, private schools are doing really well because they have the marketing materials, they have the development staff. I think the smaller organizations organizations, it's harder because you don't have, it's that catch-22. You're trying to serve more people with rising costs, and you don't always have the money to invest in marketing materials right. or a great development person. So it's more of a struggle. And so what we say when we work with those nonprofits, and we as a firm have run a number of pro bono workshops and done things through Stanford Social Innovation Review to kind of share this wisdom, um, trying to help these nonprofits understand how they actually reach these new donors. And it is a lot of the things we've been talking about, emphasizing your impact. Um, really talking about innovation and disruption, going to where their networks are. This generation of tech givers are heavily influenced by their peers. They turn to their peers for advice. Yeah. So again, you know, there's a, there's a challenge here, and I think nonprofits need to rise to meet the challenge. You know, Rick, I would add that we're seeing you know, technology disrupt many industries. Right. My guess is that in the future, we're going to have fewer people in our development departments, and we're going to be deploying more technology. Yeah. When we look at the question that you posed early on, and, and we're struggling with, with it, is how do we know that we have impact? How do we know that we're really moving the needle? Because if, in fact, we take the best intentions of many donors, regardless of age, let's not just paint this you know, as kind of young people are pushing this. Um, we're looking at uh, the geeky side of the business, yeah. and that's really to look at data science. Mm -hmm and to really look at predictive analytics. And so whether we're looking at the correlations that help us to better understand early learning outcomes, or we're correlating you know, public health information to say whether we're making substantial changes against chronic disease, you know, data architects are gonna be an integral part of this entire conversation. In fact, maybe the next panel, you should have a really great data architect. Mm -hmm. Because looking at predictive analytics, is, is the threshold of really looking at theories of change. And then, yeah, as we're talking about collective impact, how together do we work in a particular problem? Utilizing data to say that together, you know, we're gonna actually solve that. And we've seen some real shifts. And I'd love to hear Daniel, I just wanna 
you know, talk about, <laughs> no, really, what, what, what they've done with, with Tipping Point and also Nadine Burke Harris. Uh, well, first, I, I, I think you said that a lot of people in this room, including myself, might be out of a job. Is that what you were saying? The robot. <laughs> yeah. So I'm a little nervous now. Yeah, my but. daughter's putting him out of business in the food industry. So let's do the same thing here. Um, I, I, what Nadine? What? Well, I just think that you know that Nadine is is I really the deploying. Were coming no, from this side. No, I, I, I'm going to shift that for a second because you've really done something with Tipping Point that is actually changing the scope of a community. Well, but but I would say I appreciate that, and I I think. Uh, what we've always said is it's actually the, f the folks on the ground, the 43 organizations, the wise of the world that are actually interacting with people on the ground that are, you guys are changing lives. We're trying to facilitate, mm -hmm. like you are pointing out, these organizations' ability to track their outcomes to, you know, we've invested many times over in Salesforce databases and other uh, tools for a housing group or for a Nadine Burke Harris to understand are they seeing results when their clients come through their door? Are they seeing it six months out, 12 months out? Are people staying housed with Martha Ryan at the homeless prenatal program? Um, or are they losing their housing in, a, in this high rents environment? So um, our groups are getting stronger at the data piece. We still have a long way to go because it's hard for them to afford those right. those people, and that's where we need to get these companies helping us yeah. out. Yeah, I want to just add a point. So I think I think it's a little bit of a both and here. I think technology is definitely necessary for the data collection, the impact measurement, um, and I think fundraising will continue to be a relational game. I mm -hmm. actually think what we've seen with the we've worked with a number of high net worth families in the valley and foundations, and that personal connection still really really matters. Here's the thing, I think this new generation, I hope that one of their points of disruption will be funding the things that they want the nonprofits to provide. So funding the capacity, funding the infrastructure, yeah. funding the data systems, right? Because yep. I think the older generation of philanthropy, you know, we had the overhead myth for decades. Yes. Yep. We're still trying to get over that. People want to fund the sexy stuff. They want to fund the service delivery. They don't want to fund the back office, but we don't run our businesses that way. We shouldn't run our nonprofits that way. So I'm hoping that's a point of disruption. And that's a, that's a pillar of Tipping Point's philosophy. Yeah, I mean, from 2005, we said we're going to support general operating support. Uh, we're going to uh, help you invest in the unsexy. We always said the unsexy. We should have said, uh, anyway, you can do it very <laughs> better. So um, absolutely, I mean, as, as we appeal to the business sector, the tech sector, we should tell them, hey, when you went out and got your first round of funding or your A round or your B round, those investors weren't like, okay, you can have my $1 million, but you have to spend it just right. on this piece of your work. No, they believed in the entrepreneur. They believed in the team they were building. And so we believe in, in the entrepreneurs like a Nadine or a Martha Ryan or a Jay Banfield at Year Up. Like that's, that's who we believe in. And we're going to surround them with everything that is available to them in this amazing business community. Uh, several months ago, I had a conversation with a, a, a person I called a philanthropist, a well-known person in the Bay Area. And, he said, I'm not a philanthropist. I don't see myself as a philanthropist. That's, I'm a financial, I'm a partner. Um, you know, is the term evolving? What terms should we be using about philanthropists or donors? What, have you heard this? I, I will say that I've had, I've had issues with the word um, yep. because people used to say it when I was, you know, 28 years old and starting Tipping Point. They were like, you're a philanthropist. And I was like, Oh, man, I thought that was only, you know, if you were in your 60s, your 70s, your 80s. Okay, be careful uh, there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were in your 40s, so I thought I was safe. Um, Good save. Thank you. Uh, and I, I always, we talk about a tipping point as investors. Like, we're investing in these organizations. We want to see a return, and we want to see metrics. Um, and so I don't, listen, um, I read this amazing piece on, on, on Laureen Powell Jobs last night in the Washington Post. You all should check yeah. it out. Um, she, she claims the word philanthropist. So, you know, it's, 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 a, it's not a bad word, but for me, it, 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 it uh, sells somebody short when you are going all in like you two are or like many of you are. I think there's more to it than yeah. just giving away money. It's really investing. It's wanting to dig in, roll up your sleeves. Um, my mind goes to someone that's just 
passing money out. It's um, a donation so. rather than an investment. Yes. Yep. Yeah, I do think these donors think of um, their philanthropy as an investment, and they mm -hmm. use an investment mindset. I mm -hmm. also think um, you know the term social entrepreneur has been around for 20 years now. Mm -hmm. Um, I think this notion of driving impact, um, philanthropy in and of itself is a little bit of a loaded word. We did some work last year with the mm. Gates Foundation Giving Pledge team, and we hosted a, a focus group for high net worth women who were just getting involved in their philanthropy, and many of them were like, don't call me a philanthropist. And I think that partly signals some of the baggage that's coming with being an ultra-wealthy individual in today's society. Right. There's a lot of ambivalence. So I think, I think some donors are really proud to claim that term mm -hmm. and say, I am a philanthropist, I love humankind, I am out doing good in the world. I think other donors, especially those at the very beginning of their giving journey, um, are a little more ambivalent because philanthropy has a lot of connotations as well about power and charity. I think mm -hmm. charity is definitely a word we've moved away yeah, from. Right. Um, so, yeah. Okay. The, you know, you, you, we often hear in the tech community that, you know, you really have, you haven't made it until you failed. You know, that, you know, you've got to have two or three failures and learn from your mistakes before you, um, you know, you're, you're considered a success. But, do the same sort of lessons apply to non? Is this there's a is there a similar level of forgiveness in the nonprofit sector, or are donors less willing to take risks, more risk averse, and um, maybe less forgiving when something that they've invested in doesn't work? I remember very clearly. Uh, I don't know. It's probably about ten years ago. Melinda Gates said, "Look, we invested several hundred million dollars in the New York City school system. We made a bet. It didn't work." We don't apologize. We just move on, and right. that's sort of our culture. Well, Mark Zuckerberg made a $100 million bet in Newark that didn't pan out so well, and there was a book written about that. So, so I, I actually do think there is, again, a bit of a difference here between um, there's a lot of similarities between older philanthropy and new philanthropy, and there are some interesting differences. And one of the differences is I think institutional philanthropy has become a little more risk-averse over time, run by professional staff, don't want to be in the newspapers, having funded something that has a scandal or a failed. I think Mark Zuckerberg actually is a great model because he failed and he picked himself up quickly and moved right on and started Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. So I actually hope this new generation is willing to fail fast and try things that may not work because that's the only way we're going to make progress on some of these big issues. We're, I mean, we're going after chronic homelessness in San Francisco. So if you don't think that we are okay with um, attention, I mean, we're a, one of the things I will say about that is that we're a year in and the streets, I think, would you, I would argue, are worse than they were a year ago. Um, and and we, have, we have donors and we have board members that are pushing and saying, OK, I'm not seeing results. But to Chuck's earlier point, this is long, yeah. hard work. This is going to be a 5, 10, 15 year effort. It took us 35 years for the streets to look like they are and to be failing our community like we are right now. It's not going to, you can't just have an overnight success on something as profound as homelessness. So um, we're absolutely committed to this notion of if we're not going to, if we're not going to take risks, then this is not the business that we should be in. 20% of our groups that we funded over the years, we've, you know, they've exited from our portfolio for not hitting their metrics or for just not being the right fit. Yep. We cannot be scared to fail yep. in this industry. Right. That's great. Um, te uh, corporate giving, as we pointed out in the report, is 5%. Um, we hear we, a lot of our partners say, you know, we got to get do better with corporations. You know, they've got all this money. Why aren't we get, receiving more support from corporations? A couple things. Does the new tax policy with corporate uh, uh, tax rates uh, decreasing significantly, will that impact corporate giving? And do you see any other changes in corporate giving, I guess especially in the tech community? You know, one thing that we have to call attention to, again, with hubris, is where we live. Yeah. I mean, when we're living right in the shadow of corporations that are influencing global outcomes, I think we have a tremendous opportunity to build bridges. You know, Salesforce has been mentioned a few times. They're not only generous, the Benioffs are not only generous, but also the platforms that they're creating enable technology and data architecture and predictive analytics. The same thing with Google. And so we're in a sense, we're in this environment in which we can co-create. And we should be creating those types of partnerships 
I would say the same thing, not just in terms of tech, but I would say that the, the whole healthcare industry, life sciences, look at our university sector and look at the intellectual property that we have to work with. And so a part of what we're doing within the YMCA is taking our, our, the, the breadth of what we do and the landscape of what we do and really apply it in a much deeper way in partnership and collaboration with significant institutions that are after these sorts of things. Mm -hmm. And so when we look at, the, the, at looking at science, for example, and this is again one of these little nerdy things that we're doing, we're in, engaged in the study to look at the biology of, of adversity. Hmm. You know, what does it mean for people to live in systemic poverty and how does that influence their biological health? We're interested in it because that's one of the core areas of our, of our portfolio. But when you can work with the University of California at San Francisco with research scientists, and we're deployed on the ground in significant communities here, we're, we're bridging the knowledge gap that I believe is going to shift the dialogue in many places in the world. And so it's not you know, a, a single you know, kind of way in which you want to look at like Google or a Facebook or a, a Salesforce, but what is the power of us being really in the forefront of working together to solve systemic, local, regional, national, and global problems? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And I think when you look at corporate giving, the cash amount out the door is actually quite low compared to other sources. And right. your data showed that, right. our data showed that. Silicon Valley companies don't actually give a lot in terms of grants. Mm -hmm. I think what they do have is they have other assets. They give a lot through employee giving, um, cash matching programs. And by the way, a lot of those are under leveraged and under tapped. Um, they do a lot through um, employee engagement because it provides a benefit to their company to get their employees out into the community and feel like they're having an impact in some way. Um, and then they do a lot through their platforms and their technology. So when you actually look at corporate giving, I think you have to look at this more complex picture that they're doing a lot That's with right. their tech. It's not just with, measured you know, right, in dollars. Salesforce, the you know, donations, the in-kind right. product. You know? And so when you approach corporations, Really, it's not about asking for a grant. It's looking for what's the strategic partnership and how can I leverage the assets of this institution rather than just looking for a handout. And that the culture of a sales force would be a, 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 a spirited generosity I mean, because it's not just the company, but it's the people who work there and who are giving and who are involved Absolutely. in their communities as well, all the across the yeah. board. Yeah. Sorry, Daniel. No, no. I I think back to you know Mark and, and Lynn and, and, and Salesforce. I think when you go after corporations, you have to go after the people that work there. Yep. And, and it starts really at the grassroots and you gotta engage the employees because that's who, if the CEO doesn't get it, there's a, there's a potential that he or she gets it because the, 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 the force of the employee base. Um, I mean, just not necessarily philanthropic, but look at Google's decision now to you know, stop working with the, the Pentagon on an yep. AI project. I mean, that came straight from the employees. Um, what I would say is uh, we've, we've now been at this 13 years trying to get companies to give, and, and we, we've gotten a number of them to give generously. The most uh, interesting data point we have is the North Bay Fire Relief. And so we teamed up with uh, Salesforce and Mark and Lynn and Twilio and the San Francisco Giants and Kaiser and Google and others. And we raised $17 million at the concert at AT&T Park, um, 40,000 people. And uh, you, we need dollars from these companies. We don't just need their products. And so sometimes I don't want to let them off the hook with just their products. We do need cash for the work that you all are, 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 are doing, but we also need their product. Yep. I'm going to ask one more question then before we open up to the audience. And uh, we, as I said earlier, we had an, we've had several of these events. And this morning we had an event in New York City that CCS um, hosted. And uh, Dr. Una Asili, who is the head of the Indiana Center on Philanthropy, Indiana University Center on Philanthropy, she was the sort of the main speaker. And Chuck, you, hit the, you said this a couple of minutes ago. She said, there are two forces to pay attention to right now, technological innovation and shifts in the tax policy. So we've talked a lot about uh, technology and innovation and what that means. And Daniel rightfully pointed out, Chuck, that we're going to be replaced by robots here in the next 10 or 20 years. But r people in the audience, I'm guessing, are going to ask the question about changes in the tax, shifts in the tax policy. Can you talk a little bit about that, the three of you? Um, I know it's very early. We don't have really any data because the, it's just going into effect this year. But what do you anticipate changes good Yeah, Rick, you know, there's been a persistent effort on the part of certain senators to decrease the charitable deduction. 
Um, and that, Senator Grassley has been a leading proponent of that over time. But played against that are the urgencies of communities. And so when we look at religion being you know, the highest level of giving in this country, religion is spread across the landscape. And so if we look at many of the factors, you know, they're not blue, they're not red, they're human conditions in fragile communities that really need help. And I believe that in the long run, Congress is smarter than politics. And when you're looking at you know, certain leaders that really need to step up and really talk about this. You know, another point that I would make is that, is that much of this is actually not driven by the changes in the marginal tax rate. Um, one of the things, one of the anomalies that we see is that people will give a certain amount no matter what. Mm -hmm. And, you know, while a lot of these are, are tax influenced, especially I think at the larger um, an institutional level, and we have to pay attention, we have to be diligent in Washington to ensure that we do not eliminate the charitable deduction. It's an important relationship between our tax code and our giving. Um, and again, I'm just going to repeat it, the, the votes are up there. The confidence in government is at an all-time low in the United States. And so I think that we need to continue to pressure not just you know, the, uh, the federal government, but all units of government to ensure that our sector is really safe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, did a, we just did a national, um, just a quick survey. We went out and talked to about 25 leaders of large nonprofits around the country for a paper we published called The New Normal. And it was looking at what is it like to be a nonprofit on the front lines of social change in the era of Trump and in this administration. And I think one of the largest concerns we heard, well, a couple things, it was the tax cut and potentially um, the impact of the tax bill on reducing charitable giving, and we just don't know yet, right? right. We don't know how that's gonna play out and how it's gonna be offset against the fact that we have a booming economy and people are making a lot of money. So um, TBD, right? I think the other concern we heard was about uh, federal budget cuts and the trickle down effect. And so social services being cut back, that's actually gonna potentially have a large impact on the sector as well. Right. So I I think what philanthropists need to be doing is funders and individual donors need to be standing by and looking at how is the sector being impacted over this next year or two, and where can I step in with my resources to meet some of those gaps? Thanks. Uh, the one thing I've seen which is, is interesting just with the corporate tax cut um, is a rush to uh, tax, government, uh, tax business here in California, and I think that's something that uh, we should not be careful of, but really be thoughtful about because we had two, at least two taxes on the San Francisco ballot here in San Francisco. There's more coming in November. And I, and I, I'm gonna sound like a Republican, but <laughs> uh, I think, uh, or a conservative, um, that these businesses at, you know, 50% or individuals at 50 plus percent, like we have to have them stay and pay their taxes here in, San Francisco or in the state of California, because these companies, because they, people can move so quickly now, we lose that tax base. And so I think it's something that we should be thoughtful about and thinking about. Um, we need more resources for our social issues here in the Bay Area, but we need to bring business into the conversation instead of it being a, a uh, us against them or you know people against tech or people against finance because if we can come together come up with one big kind of grand bargain which is what I think we need on an issue like homelessness not these piecemeal tax cuts and so I, I think that's something that we all have to think uh, carefully about thanks so we have about 20 minutes left and what we'd love to do is ask uh, invite members of the audience to ask panelists uh, questions. If you don't mind, you tell us who you are and the organization uh, you represent. And if you want to direct your questions at one of the panelists, please do so. But we have, so we've got a little bit of time for that. So please, and stand up and, and ask away. Yes. Okay. Hi, I'm Lorraine Wigert-Long. I'm a proud board member of the Stemtown YMCA, and I'm also a development assistant director at Aquarium of the Bay. Oh. 
I'm Lorraine Woodruff Long. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a proud member of the Stonestown y, Family Y Board of Directors, and I'm also um, work for the Aquarium of the Bay as a new institutional advancement director. One of my questions is about the impact of political donations. Um, at my last organization, I really saw after 2016, a lot of our very large donors said, well, not only were they moving away from the, organ the arts organization I was working with, but they also said, I'm really putting money into campaigns and politics. I personally have seen that. People I know who really weren't engaged politically are giving money and organizing, thank thankfully. But I'm, you know, because that's not measured here, I'm curious about the political engagement and donation impact on, on philanthropy, especially locally. I, I mean, I think it's, I, I don't know. I actually haven't looked at that impact. Um, I tend to think, at least the donors we talk to, it's a both and, right? That they're funding politics because that gets you to the root cause and the larger systemic change, and they're funding, they're continuing to do grant making philanthropy. Um, yeah. A anecdotally, I think people are feeling uh, maxed out. Uh, I think not only politics, but I also think we just had just so many um, disasters last year, natural disasters that people gave to. Uh, we at Tipping Point, in our core fundraising, stayed even for the year, year over year. Our, our year ends June 30th, um, but we added, you know, 34 million in, in fire relief and, and actually close to that in our homelessness work. So we actually are close to triple what we raised last year, but it's because of our homelessness and our fire relief uh, efforts. And, but I do hear from people that they are feeling stressed. I think people are more politically engaged. We've seen that with the turnout in the mayor election just last week. And I think the midterms are obviously on everyone's mind here in, in this region. I mean, I would just add, Lorraine, thank you for the shout out about the Stones Town. <laughs> it's beautiful. And there's another one there. Um, <laughs> Now, what I would say is that that might be a bellwether towards engagement. Mm -hmm. And we've, we've seen so many different ways in which people are exercising their First Amendment rights. Um, I hope it converts into real voting. Mm -hmm. But if one of the benchmarks, one of the early stages, especially early in life, you know, is to get out and vote and to be politically active, hopefully they're voting for a reason and that that will translate over time. When, and again, we have to look at a progression of, of involvement and engagement. And that first step in our democracy might be about raising your voice up about choices that we make and then carrying that on, on into areas of social justice, areas of social impact, areas of equity, you know, all of the other things that follow you know, in a systemic change. Thank you. Other questions? Um, oh, hi. hi. My name's Lex Lifehite. I work at the City of San Francisco's Office of Economic and Workforce Development and administer the Nonprofit Sustainability Initiative there. Um, I really appreciated what you said, Chuck, about the public sector here in San Francisco being a strong partner. And also what Heather said about the need to invest in capacity. And I was wondering, given the long timeline of government initiatives, do you have ideas or plans of how to, you know, surface the, the trends you're seeing in this data so that the government sector can sort of begin to skate where the puck will be in terms of capacity and fundraising needs of nonprofits? Do you want me to start out? Mm -hmm. Sure. Mm -hmm. Sure. So San Francisco has always been on, at least in recent memory, the edge of progressive politics. And what does it mean for us to have this entire spectrum of leadership that has been spawned? I mean, we have a disproportionate amount of leadership that has been spawned from this area. And Room 200 has been one of those places, right? City Hall of San Francisco is spawning government. And, and again, I think a part of our optimism is that we have this culture you know, we have leading senators from this area. Um, and so what I would say is that in the long run, you know, government makes a huge difference, often for great and often for bad. I mean, a lot of the racism that we have in this country is because of the underlying decisions made by the United States Supreme Court and governments around the country, right? So we have to understand that government is a part of the problem and it has to be, in a sense, a disproportionate part of the solution. And so I think that that's 
you know, what we have to lean into is that government can be the tipping point, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, and again, it's permanence. You know, our government's going to be here and things will come and they'll go. And so I think that the intellectual resources that you have, you have to get the smartest people with the type of agenda towards social justice and real, the strength of our economy to stay in government long enough to make change. So it's not just what you do with your money, but it's also creating the ladders within a very complex bureaucratic civil service system so that you can have long-term change. I, I think you need to be willing, I, I think that's a great point. I think you need to be willing to break things and to try new things, but have a long-term partnership with the private sector or with philanthropy and invite them in, but then hold them accountable because you all are doing incredibly difficult work with the not a lot of resources. I mean, you walk into some of those offices and, and your email is, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's kind of wild. Um, <laughs> it, it, should, it should not be the case in a city like San Francisco or any municipality in this region. So get them in the door, say, listen, we, we're gonna need you for the next three, four years to help us build this system. Don't say, oh, we just need a, a small grant or an intern for a summer. Like get real people in the door for a long period of time to help you with these huge challenges. Let me add, add one little coda to this. A word that we're increasingly using, regardless of what we do, is this notion of equity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I'm seeing in our San Francisco city government is in almost every single sector, there is an equity lens. And that's really shifting the dialogue because it's requiring us to look at things that we haven't wanted to look at before. And so, you know, you have both your siloed approach, but you also have the ability to scale large ideas and really focus in on that. And we've seen, I mean, we don't have to talk about marriage equality as being a value, but that is held because we understand how to apply that in San Francisco. It's about equity, right? So... You've got a lot of tools, and some of them are hard skills, and some of them are soft tools, and I would use them all. Hi. Uh, Dwight Wilson with Global Teaming in the East Bay. I have two related questions around crowdfunding. First, is there any mention of crowdfunding in the report? Um, any data maybe off the top of your head you might remember? You know Just wondering if that's uh, in there. The, the, in the, the more extensive report, there will be um, data about on, just online giving, electronic giving, that it's increasing, but I don't think in particular to crowdfunding, but we can check. Okay. Second question, I apologize, this may relate a little to the future of your jobs and maybe other <laughs> ones here. Any, the panelists or anyone here heard about a new idea about reverse crowdfunding, where you start with a fund, say started by a crypto millionaire or billionaire, and you go to the global crowd to allocate that fund, to assess and evaluate projects, to vet and ultimately to vote, on how to allocate that money. Any, <laughs> any of you know anything about that? Are you suggesting anything? the oligarchy of philanthropy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, I mean, I don't know if I, I've heard of that model specifically. I will say one trend that we're keeping our eye on is this whole notion of big bet philanthropy. Mm. So working with the Gates Foundation, I think there was something, a slide in here that said there were 11 gifts of 100 million or more mm. just coming out of the Bay Area. Um, we're doing a little bit of work with the MacArthur Foundation, 100 and change. So that's a very new trend. And what we're also seeing is that sometimes um, donors are choosing to pool their resources and aggregate funds, like the Blue Meridian Fund, which came out of the Edna McConnell Clark Foundation. And there are a number of Bay Area high net worth families and donors participating in that, where the minimum threshold is 50 million. So they're aggregating their funding because they're realizing that you can't actually get to the large scale systemic change by giving out $50,000 grants, right? right? So that is a trend, and I think that we're just at the very, very front end of that, um, where you're gonna see more of these donor collaboratives and pools. It's kind of like a next generation venture philanthropy, like Draper Richards Kaplan. I mean, even the Tipping Point does this as well, right? You're, you're aggregating resources so you can have larger impact on the issues. And well, affect that's a how whole we ecosystem. thought about the 100 million. Yeah. And yeah. yeah. And one of the big areas I think where this is active is in the environment, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I think that we live in a particularly rich region. And if you looked at that list of major donors, you could almost begin to pick out the names of individuals that are behind that, that are really crowdfunding to make a, a difference in our environmental resources and in the deployment 
you know, of, of this on a global level. So I, I think that there are some wonderful practices. You know, but it's, it's different when you get into social change. That's a much more complex, more local um, set of issues. Um, I just want to add to that answer. Uh, I think the first model I saw that for that was uh, Kiva. So one big donation from a person, and then they went to the crowd to ask them for, um, I guess, a crowdsourcing of the $20 donations, wherever they wanted. Mm -hmm. uh, so my name is John Toe. I'm a founder of a startup. I'm trying to take the, I guess, uh, private route uh, toward, uh, I guess, food security and uh, poverty alleviation around uh, rice agriculture. My question is around, um, culturally, how do you get the institutional and like foundation investors to think more like VCs? I, I don't, you guys touched on uh, data being that, but these people are already rooted in data, so I don't think it's just about the data. There's right. like inherently more cultural aspects to it. Well, I think what you're seeing, we've, we've named a couple of, you know, uh, Chan Zuckerberg and, and Emerson Collective as being LLCs and the ability to invest in nonprofits and for profits. And so there, that is a growing trend, if you will. Uh, and so those are, those are folks that are making bets on, on startups. You know, we, we made, we've made bets on nonprofit startups. We have, we don't, we are a 501c3, so we, we can't necessarily invest in for profits, but, um, I don't know if you have others. Yeah, no, I think I think that's right. I mean, and you touched on this earlier before, but I think that the um, the sector boundaries are blurring, and so this next generation of philanthropy, you are seeing these new philanthropists who do come out of tech and actually have a VC mindset, acting more like they did as investors in their philanthropy, and so setting up LLCs, right. funding for profits. I mean, I was thinking about you know. Um, there's you know, various education and ed tech funds that are funding hybrid organizations. Um, even Omidyar actually piloted this more than a decade ago before Emerson and some of these others. So we are seeing this trend and I actually think you're in a good place because if you're a for-profit entrepreneur trying to solve social problems but in, in an area where there might be eventually some kind of a market return, I actually think it's gonna be easier to attract capital than the peer nonprofit yes. place. I think the pure nonprofits that are solving for market failure, where there's never going to be a payback or an exit, that's actually a harder game in terms mm -hmm. of raising capital. Agreed. You know, I would also echo that the nonprofit sector should not be jealous of private capital that wants to solve a, system a systemic problem, right? Yeah. Um, this is not the, a question of being in competition, but looking at who is best able to address a big problem. An example of that if, is that if you look in China at out-of-school time, there is a tremendous need for uh, educational resources being pointed in that direction. The, non, the nonprofit sector is not established to answer that, but the for-profit sector is really w looking very deeply into learning gaps and achievement gaps and really going at it aggressively and taking a very, very important stand in raising the educational standards of kids in China. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not against that one iota. Right. And to the extent to which we can find those types of partnerships, I think is wonderful. Th th it's not an either or thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it, and I think that the panel is trying to say that we're learning how to work better together. Mm -hmm. well, I think it was Daniel's point about you know, businesses and partnering with businesses. And so you know, we're, we're, we are working collaboratively rather than against each other mm -hmm. because it isn't a zero sum game. Well, but also I think that now I'm going to do some double talk. There is the notion of I call the hubris of the billionaire that if you just put me in charge of this problem, I could solve it. And that is where you begin to throw money at problems on a very unsophisticated basis. So it's not just leaning into it, but it's also, I think, a question of hubris. And, and you have to sometimes talk a person down and say, you know, I understand that you want to have that impact but you need to understand what it's like to be on the ground with that problem. Warren Buffett said when he gave his gift to the Gates Foundation, he said that giving money away is a skill. It requires a skill that I don't possess. I'm good at capital allocation. But if I gave it to Bill and Melinda, it's a skill they do possess. Um, you know, and I think, Chuck, that's kind of the example, too, that for people Absolutely. who you don't have the hubris and you have the clarity of mind. But I think to your point, a lot of people don't see it that way. We have reached a point in the program where there's only, there's only, there's time for only one more question. If you have other questions, we're happy to stay afterwards, or, but this, this would be the last question. 
Thank, Thank you. you so much. Rebecca Johnson with the Estuary and Ocean Science Center. Uh, we are an interesting organization. We're part of SF State, so we're educational, but we study climate change. We're the only marine research center on SF Bay. So we're more of an environmental organization, even though we're part of a large institution. And I'm curious about your statistic about donors who are not interested in recognition, since we're starting a capital campaign that includes naming opportunities. Um, <laughs> and I've also relocated from the South Florida market where there was no interest in unrecognized gifts. <laughs> so I'm curious what went into discerning that, because I think there's a certain amount of social pressure you. to say you yeah. don't want recognition, yeah. but I have no experience with yeah. those types of donors. So is that a regional thing? Or if you could elaborate more sure. how you and, and, I, and you have that. to you have to watch the curb your enthusiasm with Ted Danson and being the anonymous donor. So just find that, find that, find that episode. I think... Um, what I would say about recognition is it's, it's not the primary motivator, but we feel like it's, it can be a very useful tool, actually, to help you frame the request. And I think you're right. There are a lot of donors who will say, you know, I'm not interested in recognition, but it can be, again, sorry for the, the phrase, Daniel, it can be the tipping point for some donors to I make it. I love that phrase. <laughs> <laughs> it can be to make, to make a final decision. What, what I think we're saying is impact is the primary motivator, recognition can be a motivator. So I wouldn't dismiss it. And I would say in the, our community, that's probably true across the board, I would think. Yeah. Well, I want to thank all of you for coming. Um, I want to thank our panelists again, Chuck and Heather and Daniel uh, for this fabulous panel. I want to thank Gloria Duffy and the Commonwealth Club for hosting us and the Foundation Center West for partnering with us. And it is now my honor to adjourn this meeting. Great. Good work. Thanks, sir.